Well, we've been in our series on the authority of the believer. Hope you've been getting a little bit from that. Is that all right? Praise God. But we got a lot more to do, a lot more to go. This is our third installment in this series. And so we're going to talk to you today about um, Jesus won his authority by conquest. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the mystery of Calvary. So this message has kind of got a title and a subtitle. Is that all right? So we've talked to this point about a number of things as it relates to just that authority that's been given to us. And I give you a lot of information. Of course, we're going to give you a lot more today too, but we're going to let some of these things that we're laying foundationally spring us into some things that'll be a little more specific as we go through. You can expand certain parts of it once you lay the foundation adequately. And so that's what we're doing. So the last two weeks, that's what we've done. And so we're building from that a little bit. But what we're talking to you today about, I think is, is critical to understanding the authority that he's given to us and how it was obtained. And we, we've already talked about it a little bit, but you're gonna understand it a little bit more after today. Amen. I said, amen. amen. So you got your Bible? You got your iPad? You got your phone? We got all kinds of forms of carrying the word around with us today. Don't we? It's all good. Praise God. I'm, I'm real thankful for the technology that we have, aren't you? But I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Now, some of these things, by virtue of just the topic that we're on, some of these things will have been said before. Some of it will expand on it. Some of it we'll probably say again and again and again because it's necessary to establish this truth and to build upon it, amen. So if we repeat ourselves, it's not just accidental, it's intentional because that's how we grow. We grow somewhat by repetition. Now we're not being repetitious for the sake of just saying it again and again and again, but we're being repetitious enough to build the truth inside us, amen, to make it real down in our heart. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Now the word mystery right there simply means a secret. There's something that's secret. You don't know it until it's revealed. You really don't know God unless God reveals himself. God in general is a mystery. He's invisible. You can't hear him with your ears unless he manifests himself that way. But the only thing that we know about God is really what he reveals to us, what he allows us to know. Now, when you think about who God is and who we are and our limits on, if you take just the universe that we live in, now God is bigger than the universe. The universe that we can see through the telescopes and see the stars at night and the vastness of it is simply a creation from God. It does not contain God. He's bigger than that. He somehow was able to create a universe that's so vast that we would spend lifetimes not knowing it all. And that's just one of his creations. Now there's many more too. You say, what are they? I don't know. See, that's what I'm saying. The only thing that you know about him is what he lets you know. He gives you a glimpse into him. Now in the days to come, the years to come, the ages to come, scripture says, we'll understand more and more and more. And he's going to show his riches to us and his goodness and his kindness to us in the ages to come. And that's a marvelous thing when you think about it. So God has allowed us on the inside. But still, as Paul said, we see through a glass darkly. We don't see much. We see some, but we just don't see much. But I'm thankful for what I do see. Amen. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. Now the princes, that's a reference, direct reference to demonic activity. You know, there were the, the third of the angels that fell with Lucifer. And they, they still now serve in that capacity, that dark capacity, that dark world that they, they want to control and, want, and they want to run your world too. 
But those demonic forces, those princes of this world knew, it says, for none of those princes knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So that mystery that was hidden was not hidden so much from you. Now we know it somewhat. We're still unfolding it. But it was hidden for the purpose of protecting the truth of it so that Satan couldn't get a run at it or couldn't get a shot at it. So Satan couldn't sidetrack it or push it off before it accomplished what it was intended to accomplish. Amen. So we see this mystery in verse 7, this hidden wisdom had to do at the latter part of verse 8 with crucifixion. So crucifixion and what took place at the crucifixion was a secret. It was a mystery that Satan didn't know. It was something that was withheld. And so we know it somewhat. Well, we know it because we look back on it. But I say we, I'm talking about human beings. There might have been some glimpses into it if you knew prophetic scripture beforehand. But usually prophecy, you never fully understand it until the event happens. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there were a lot of children being born that night. It did not yet appear what he was going to be. He was just potentially a child being born. Now the angels heralded it and declarations were made about it. But the point is, all the way up until just the event itself, even though it was prophesied, even though it was known, people didn't know it till it happened. And that's the way prophecy is. Uh, you know it when it happens. You can speculate, you can see it, you know it's prophesied, you know it's coming. One of these days that trump will sound and the dead in Christ will rise. But it's all speculation up until then. When's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? I don't know. None of us do. But we know it's going to happen. Amen. And that's the way prophecy is. It kind of unfolds and then we see it clearly once it happens. But this was something that was hidden for the sake of God accomplishing what he wanted to accomplish. And it says Satan and those demonic powers did not know what it was. They didn't understand it. And we, we see that um, they were, um, if, if you read these verses right here, it says none of the princes of this world knew it. For Now, now notice how it's worded. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, see, there's this, there's this thing out here. There's people who get mad at the Jews. Well, the Jews killed Jesus. Well, they had a part to play in it. Well, the Romans killed Jesus because it was under Roman rule. That was a Roman uh, way of execution. So they had their part to play in it. But this tells us that Satan did it. Hmm. It says these demonic forces. See, when they said release Barabbas, or when they begin to shout and say crucify him, crucify him, it was the agitation of the spirit world that was bringing that to pass. Amen? And so we can blame who we want to blame, but I can tell you really who is to blame more than even the devil. It was us because he was crucified for our sins. Amen. And that's important to know because sometimes there's such a, an attempt to accuse. And those accusations are really misplaced and focused in the wrong direction. So Satan certainly inflamed the crowd. He provoked Judas to betray him. It says when, when Satan entered into Judas, that's when he betrayed the Lord. So Satan was behind it. Amen. And so our sin, more than anything, however, is what drove Jesus to Calvary. And we need to know that, and we need to be aware of it. Now, we're going to unfold this process here of really pretty much what was happening at Calvary and beyond, because there's a lot. You see what takes place externally. We know there was a cross. There was a know that there was a, a man hung on a cross. We know that. But there was a lot behind the scenes that sometimes we don't know. Because it's hidden from our view. Unless we study scripture, we don't, we don't know it. Amen. And so we find over here in John chapter 10, and 
verse number 14, he said, Jesus speaking, he said, I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so uh, know I the Father and I lay down my life. Uh, and so Jesus said that he lays down his life for the sheep. All right, now notice the phrase, I lay down my life. That means that nobody took it. He freely laid it down. He goes on to say, he said, another sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Now it depends on how you look at this. Um, he said, there's a fold that I lay down my life for, a fold of sheep. He said, but there's another fold. Now in the day that Jesus was crucified, the fold that was readily present right then was Israel. And the other fold that would come would be the church. But if you look at it from our vantage point, the foal that he died for. Now he's the great shepherd of the sheep, which we are. And so there's the blending because it tells us here, he said, uh, and other sheep I have, which are not of this foal, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So in other words, he's bringing the two together in what he did. Amen. I said, Amen. He said, therefore, doth my father love me because I laid down my life. Now listen, that I might take it again. So he laid down his life knowing he was going to take it again. Now, you, you, you have to understand the harmony of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the second member of the Godhead. God the Father is number one. Jesus is number two. The Holy Spirit is number three. So that's the, that's the Godhead. And they're in perfect harmony. And there's perfect, absolute trust one to the other. And so when Jesus went to, uh, through this process, he had to submit himself to the will of the Father. And he had to ex ex absolutely, implicitly trust the Father without question because he placed his eternal future in the Father's hands. So you see the trust and the harmony that had to come out of that for that to happen. You will we'll unfold that a little bit more as we go. He said, for no man taketh it from me. And so he said that no man could take his life. He said, no man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. So you see the harmony of Jesus and the father in this. And the Holy Spirit really is the power of God. The Bible says Jesus was raised again from the dead by the uh, glory of God. It also says he was raised again from the dead by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit and the glory of God are one and the same. They're the same. Amen. I said, amen. amen. So when you remember when Adam lost his glory, when he sinned, he lost, lost the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's what happened. It's an interesting stuff, isn't it? So he said, I have power to take it again, and this commandment I received of my Father. So here we find Jesus going through this process that would ultimately lead to Calvary, a free choice, a free will, and no man could force it. He gave his life a ransom for many. Nobody took it. And that's important. Amen? And we find over here Matthew chapter uh, 26, verse number 53, in relationship to this, he said, Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to the Father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? So Jesus said, now remember, Jesus' title, now Jesus has a number of titles. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's the only begotten. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's the Rose of Sharon. He's Shiloh. He's the bright morning star. There are many titles that refer to Jesus all through Scripture. Dozens of them. Amen? amen? I said amen. But one of the titles that Jesus owns and holds is Lord of hosts. Now, hosts are the armies of heaven, the angelic armies of heaven. And so when it says Jesus is the Lord of hosts, that means he's the Lord of angelic hosts or the angelic armies of heaven. Now he said, now, now listen to how he said it right here. He said, um, all I have to do is pray. All I have to do is ask. And there shall be more than, not just that and no more. 
it would be the, the, the statement that's being made here is whatever it would take. But so you'll have an understanding of what I'm saying. He said, all I have to do is pray and he'll give me more than 12 legions of angels. And he used the word legion because remember, he was in a Roman environment where people understood that. The Roman military was everywhere. And a legion was 6,000 men. So when he said he'll give me 12 legions of angels, if I ask for it, that's 72,000 angels just with one request. So no man took his life. Now we find over here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse number 30, 35, just to illustrate what that could mean. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out. And smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. And when they rose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. A hundred and eighty-five thousand slain by one angel. And he's got seventy-two thousand at his disposal. Talk about power. Now that's the group, listen. This on your side. <laughs> That's who he said he gives his angels charge over you to bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And that's the group that, of course, under God, but that's the group that works with you. Well, the devil, the devil, the devil, nothing. Y'all start magnifying the one that counts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're not alone in this. Well, I feel so alone. Well, you're not. Amen. And so we have one angel that killed 185,000 in one night. Now I'm going to tell you, you get that group on your side, you're going to do all right. Amen. I hate to say it. Poor old devil. <laughs> now, I don't have compassion for him, but he actually thinks he's going to win. Now that's ignorance at the highest level you can imagine. You talk about completely, totally delusional. But now you got to remember something. He's a liar and the father of it. And there is no truth in him. So that's why he believes this stuff. Because he's completely, totally deceived. Now he's a deceiver, but he's completely, totally deceived. He, he's deceived himself. He thinks he can beat God. Well, guess what? He won't win. That's not going to happen. But he thinks it, and that's why he still works. So he's busy, but it's all in vain because his days are coming. Actually, in some ways, it's already happened. But it'll be fully manifested in not many days hence. Amen, because we're the winners. We're not the losers. <laughs> you know, as they say, I've read the back of the book and we win. Amen. And we do for sure. So we're talking about what took place at Calvary, but not just at the cross, but beyond the cross and who that through that whole process that was related to that. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse number two, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of God. And so Jesus endured the cross. He didn't, Jesus didn't want to do that. You remember in the garden leading up to Calvary, his, his sweat became his great drops of blood. And he said, father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. He didn't want to do that, but he did it. He despised what he was going to have to do, but he did it anyway. He did it not for himself, he did it for us. He endured the cross, despising the shame that he could lead many sons unto glory. So he did it for the family. God, from the inception of what you find in scripture, from the very beginning, has been in the process of building family. And he's going to have one. 
He's already got a good part of one, but he's got more coming. There's many that have not entered in yet, but there are many that are coming, saith the Lord, that you've not seen yet, nor has it entered into your heart and mind just what harvest is coming to this planet and to this earth. Because I am going to have my way, saith the Lord, and nobody, no man, no demon, no power will stop it, saith the Lord. That's a fact. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, when he sat down, that's an indication of work finished. Have you ever been out working in the yard real hard, you know, all day? And you, you come in and, and Nora makes you a glass of lemonade. Now, she's not making you one. She made it. But anyway, somebody does. And you come in, you sit down, and you make old people noises. <laughs> <laughs> you know, old people noises. We laugh about that. She told me today, she said, that sounds like an old person noise. I said, well, I think it is. You know, I said, but I can't be old. I said, because if I was old, I'd have an old wife. And I said, I know I don't have an old wife. And she said, I know you're right. <laughs> There's ways around it, guys. <laughs> Amen. We can get agreement if we know how to word it. Amen. Praise God. So Jesus laid down his life for us. Work finished. Now he tells us in John 10 and 11, he said, I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So he did what he did for us. Amen. And we find in Isaiah 53, now I know a lot of these things you're familiar with, but we're putting it in a context that's important. Amen. In Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, surely, now that starts out with power. That means no doubt about it. Surely, surely, surely. No question, no wondering, no doubt. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Surely he did. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. In other words, he did it, but in many cases because of that mystery that was hidden, people looked at it and didn't know what they were looking at. They just thought, well, must be God smiting him. We just thought he was smitten of God. He, he, he went too far. He was a good man. He taught good. Give great lessons. He did a lot of good. He went about healing and doing all sorts of things. But he must have gone too far because God killed him. Said that's what they thought. Thought he was stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but <laughs> he was wounded for our transgressions. Mm -hmm. See, they thought one thing, but something else was going on. That's that mystery. Thinking one thing, something else happened. But he was wounded for our transgressions. It wasn't his because he didn't commit any transgressions, any iniquities. There was no sin in him, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Jesus did all that for us. Now, this, this, this 53rd chapter, we're going to study it a little bit more uh, today. We'll probably get back into it more as we talk about the authority of the believer through the process of time. But we're going to look at some more things here in a minute. But this 53rd chapter of Isaiah is really a redemption chapter. It really gives us an Old Testament. It's, it's an Old Testament chapter with a New Testament revelation. This is what God did through Jesus, our Savior, His Son. This is what opened the door for the whole process we call redemption. This is what did it. Isaiah 53 is that redemptive chapter in the Old Testament. Tremendous truth. Amen. So Jesus took upon himself our sins. And we find in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But he was made to be sin for us. Now, some people, um, in, and you can mix words about this if you choose to. And all, I, I think sometimes we mix words to our own uh, loss. Sometimes we try to look too hard analysis 
Now, we need to study Scripture, so we're not trying to be light with the Word, but sometimes we look so deep that we can't see the truth because we've got a prejudice we bring into it. And we're trying to make our point rather than hear what the Spirit of God is just trying to say to us. But I had a real good friend, real good friend. He's in heaven now. But he said, now that, that doesn't mean he was made to be sin. I said, well, really? He said, no. He said, he was made to be a sin offering. I said, well, he was that. You know, the scapegoat in the wilderness. I mean, the, the sacrificial lamb, he was a sin offering. There's no question about that. But see, I believe it's more than that. I believe he was made a sin offering. But I believe he actually took into himself our sins. Because if he didn't, you didn't get rid of it. Because somebody's going to pay for it. See, he, he was more than just a sin offering. He was made to be sin. Not with his sin. He was never a sinner. Jesus could never be identified as a sinner. He never committed a sin. But he was made to be sin with our sin. He who knew no sin was made to be sin with our sin. Now listen, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. There was an exchange. It was an exchange of sin for righteousness. I was working. I got up the other night. I laid down and I got up. I just had the Lord just talking to me. And I'll get to it in this series. I, don't, I won't get to that part today. But just the Lord talking to me. I went in my study. I stayed in there for hours, way up to the wee hours in the morning, just writing down things of what he did for us at Calvary. We'll get to it. You'll hear it. But it's just such a revelation. He was made to be sin that we could be made. Now I want you to think about this, that we can be made righteous. Okay, great, right. You've been made righteous. He said more than that. He said that, but he said more than that. He said, you've been made the righteousness of God. Now you think God's righteous? That's the righteousness you got. The same as he has. Now, that's a different, that's a different level of righteousness. Oh, I've been made righteous, but God, you know, he's way above me in righteousness. That's not what he said. He said, you've been made the righteousness of God. God never knew you as a sinner. You were presented to him as one who never sinned. You were presented to him as one who is completely pure as the driven snow. You're as clean as Adam was before sin ever entered. That's the righteousness that you got through Calvary. He was made to be sin for you. He who knew no sin that you might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. It took the new creation to do it. You can't sugarcoat it. You can't whitewash it. You can't powder coat it. You can't coat it with anything. That's why the word atonement is an Old Testament word. It's not a New Testament word. It's only found one time in the New Testament. And when you see it, it's not the application that people use for atonement. The blood of bulls and goats and a heifer and all those things were given for the covering of sin in anticipation of the one that was covering, coming with the ultimate sacrifice who will not cover sin, but absolutely destroy it. So atonement is an Old Testament concept. You are not atoned for. Your sins have been obliterated. You don't have to do it again and again and again and again as they did under the old covenant. One time. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. You don't have to do it twice. His blood is sufficient. Period. There's no need to revisit this one. All those old ones, all those Old Testament sacrifices were in anticipation of the one who's coming who will destroy sin ultimately. That's why the atonement is an Old Testament concept. Your sin's not covered. Your sin is obliterated. It's gone. And you have been made righteous, not with just, well, man's righteousness. It says you've been made righteous with the righteousness of God Almighty. You talk about bringing us in. You know, it's, it's, it's like Steve was talking about. We didn't have any goodness to bring to God. Only goodness we've got is the goodness he gave us. But that didn't stop him. 
He did it anyway. Thank God he did it anyway. Amen. Amen. And he who knew no sin, had no sin of his own, he became sin that we might be made righteous before him and righteous enough to stand in his presence and talk to him without fear, without cowering down, without intimidation. Now, I know we come with respect. Don't misunderstand that. But you're entitled to be there. You got entrance into the family. You belong. You see, some of the authority of the believer is just simply taking your place at the table. You know, he said he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Well, if he does, come and eat. There'll be somebody tell you you're not supposed to be at the table. Well, you turn, you think you're somebody come, you think you're getting too big for your spiritual britches, you know, just shut up and get off my feet. I'm eating there. Yes. If you want to grovel around under the table, go ahead. I'm eating right now, if you don't mind. Amen. He prepared a table for us and said, come and dine. Come and dine, the master said, come and dine. You can eat at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude and turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. You hungry? Come and dine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there'll be some Christian tell you, well, you're unworthy. Well, get off my, you know, you can be unworthy if you want to. Just get off my feet while I sit at the table. Now, I'm not trying to be smart. I'm just trying to know who, know who you are, know your place, and take it. Well, that's not religious. Well, we ain't being religious right now. Amen. It's not religion we're talking about here. We talk about the power of the Almighty God who made you the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. We find over here in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 13, and you being dead in your sins. Well, that's the condition he found us in. We were dead in our sins. And the uncircumcision of your, fle of your flesh hath he quickened together. Do you know what quicken means? You ever cut your fingernail a little too close? Hurts, doesn't it? Ouch. Why? Because it's alive. See, he who quickened, cut it into the quick. Ooh. That's what he's talking about there. He said, and you hath he quickened together and made alive with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to a cross. So he took your sin and nailed it to a cross. He completely obliterated it. There was a, you know, we, we had a note burning here a while back. You remember? Well, we've had so many testimonies come in of people getting their debts paid out, getting out of debt after we did that. Just one after another. I mean, it's tremendous. You know? If you've got a testimony about that, share it with us. We'd like to hear it. You know, it, it blesses us. But anyway, a lot of things are related to that. Well, see, the, the reason you're in debt is because there's a note that has you in debt. Well, when you get the debt paid, you can burn the note. We had a note burning. That's scriptural. Because that's what he said. He said, you had a debt against you. You had a note that was written that held you in bondage. It's the sin note. It's the debt that you couldn't pay, that you had no power to pay. It's the debt that you could never pay in a million years. You could never do good enough long enough. You could never get the debt paid. But he said, since you couldn't pay the note, I'll not only forgive you of the note, I'll not only pay your debt, I'll take the note that was written against you and I'll burn the note. There'll be no evidence that there was ever a note against you. That's what the righteousness of God is. There's no note against you. Nobody can go back in history and find it. I mean, it's obliterated. That's what Jesus did for us at Calvary. He obliterated the note. He took it to Calvary and nailed it to a tree. Amen. And so the price was paid at Calvary. Amen. Here in, I'm going through this. It's all right. I'm enjoying it. If you don't enjoy it, don't tell me. I'm loving it. Amen. Matthew 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land and until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. 
which that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so here we find Jesus. Now, this is what I was talking about a minute ago. Some have said, my good friend, who, who said, now, Jesus wasn't made to be sin. He was made to be a sin offering. I said, well, I said, I get it. He even got my books down off the shelf, and he wrote in it, so I'd never forget what he was telling me. I said, all right, okay, okay. You know, but it's important to him, you know. And I get it, so I'm not fussing. He's my friend. And I love him. I just see it a little different. Amen. But anyway, the reason I said Jesus was made to be sin is because you find right here in this passage we just read that when that darkness descended and all those things that, that happened and Jesus said that word, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, my God. So the relationship with Jesus and the father was broken by what? Sin. Whose sin? Yours. Jesus was made to be sin. More than a sin offering. He actually assumed your sin. And at that moment in time, he was the picture of sin. Do you remember that when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they were being bitten by those snakes and they put a serpent up on the pole and it says if they would look upon the serpent on the pole, they'd be healed. And the serpent on the pole is a type of Jesus on the cross. Sin. Jesus was made to be sin. He who knew no sin was made to be sin with our sin. And the father who can't look on sin turned his back on him. And there was a separation. See, that's why he said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Because he relinquished control in his trust, absolute trust for the Father. He became sin. He became sin. That's amazing. That's amazing to me. Just absolutely beyond words amazing. And we find here in, in, in Isaiah 52, now again, Isaiah 53 is that redemptive chapter. But before you get to that, you see glimpses in Isaiah 52, 14. It says, as many were astonished at, astonished at thee, his visage or his appearance was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Now, if you think about, now this is talking about Jesus' grotesque appearance at Calvary. Now, remember, he was beaten. His beard was plucked out. He was crucified. He, he, his, his feet and his hands were pierced. He had a crown of thorns. He had gone through all sorts of things, that, that mock trial, agony beyond agony. But more than that, even though that as horrible as it is, Jesus assumed into himself not only the torture and the beatings that were all external. Now, they're grotesque. And they're horrible and proved to be fatal. But as bad as that is, he assumed inside himself the sin of the whole human race. Every serial killer, every serial rapist, every warmonger, Adolf Hitler type, Every bad thing that every human being ever did or ever would do, he assumed it in his own self at one time, at one point in time, at one place in time. And when it says his visage was so marred more than any man, it's talking about the external for sure. But even more than that, even more than the agony of the beating, even more than the agony of the piercing, even more than the agony of all that, into his spirit, he assumed all of the sin. Do 
This is the spotless lamb that never committed one bad act. And he assumed it all at one time. And so when it says his visage was so marked, it's more than the external. It's the internal as well. And when God the Father had separated himself from it, it would not look upon him. That's the condition that you find here. Well, I don't believe Jesus died spiritually. If Jesus had not died spiritually, you're destined to. Physical death was not enough to atone for sin or to cover sin. If that would have happened, the Old Testament covenant would have worked. Or Lazarus could have been a sacrifice for sin. Or anyone else that had died and been resurrected. But they weren't atonement for sin. They weren't covering for sin. They didn't work at that level. Amen? I said amen. amen. And so uh, here, here we find that, uh, that Jesus, when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's because God the Father could not look upon the sin that was heaped on Jesus Christ at this moment in time. Now we're talking about what happened. We're talking about where your authority comes from. We're on target with this message. The authority of the believer and what price authority? How he got it. And it wasn't cheap. You can't even imagine what it cost. Amen? And so this spotless Lamb of God took the sin of the murderer, the rapist, the warmonger, the most evil people you can imagine, and he took their sin into his own being. You say, well, why then are they not forgiven? They have to as many as received him. To them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Every one of them can, if they will. He paid the price for all. You mean Adolf Hitler could be forgiven? Yes. If he comes through the blood. Do I believe he did? No. But there'll be a lot of people in heaven you'll be surprised about. And there'll be a lot of people not there you'll be surprised about too. Amen. We find in Isaiah 53, 9. It says, now, now remember that 53rd chapter is the redemption tr chapter. Redemptive truth. Verse 9, it says this, and he made his grave with the wicked. And so there are people who talk about, well, Jesus, Jesus didn't go to hell. I heard good theologians. I mean, good, good in other ways and all sorts of truths that they bring from Scripture. Just the marvelous men with good minds and, and understand Scripture in, in great ways. And I learned from, but they don't even see this. They run right by this and don't see this. They say, Jesus didn't die spiritually. Well, listen to it. It says, and he made his grave with the wicked. Oh, so he died and then went immediately to heaven? How does that work? It says, no, he made his grave with the Well, that's talking about the tomb and, you know. No, it's not. I'll show you. And with the rich in his death. Now, this word death right here, if you look it up in the Hebrew and you study it out, and you'll have to research a little bit to do it, but that is a plural word. And so when it says death, he's not talking about physical death only. He's talking about physical death and spiritual death. Do you remember that Adam, when he was in the garden and God told him, he said, now, he said, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when you do that, in the day you do that, you'll die. Remember he said that? Okay. When they did that, did he die? I mean, did, you just, did the apple kill him? Bam. It wasn't necessarily an apple, but did the fruit kill him? No. He lived on another 900 years plus. Amen? So physical death and spiritual death are different. He did die the day that he ate of the forbidden fruit. But he didn't die physically. He died spiritually. And the Bible tells us that there are those who are dead while they yet live. So spiritual death and physical death are different. 
You know when the Bible says, let the dead bury the dead? You got to analyze that a little bit. Well, how can a dead person come out of the grave and dig another grave beside them? That wouldn't work, would it? So it'd have to be the spiritually dead burying the physically dead. It'd have to be that. Wouldn't it? I said, wouldn't it? Okay, so the point I'm making in all that is this. Spiritual death and physical death are different. And Jesus, when he said, my God, my God, Father, Father, he didn't say Father, Father. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did you turn your back on me? Because God can't look on sin. He turned his back on Jesus who became sin. And spiritual death set in on him. And so when the Bible says, and with the rich in his death, plural, spiritual and physical. He died physically. We know that. But it was more than physical death. Physical death is not enough to forgive our sins. You have to be born again in the spirit. You have to be born again in the spirit. Amen. Jesus paid the spiritual price as well as the physical price. Amen. And he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death or deaths because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. And so Jesus died a spiritual death to give us spiritual life. Now you find this outlined in what happened here, and I won't have time to read it all, but I'll read a little bit of it in Psalms 22. Psalms 22 is a prophetic psalm looking forward to this event. Okay, and you find in verse number uh, one, it says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See, it's exactly what we read in Matthew. This psalmist said this, my God, my God, this is what the psalmist saw ahead in time was coming. Jesus saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? So it's elaborating that event when Jesus said, Father, why did you forsake me? It's elaborating that event right here. You want to know more about it? Right here it is. Why are you so far from helping me and from my words of, of roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not in the night season and I'm not silent. This is Jesus on the cross right here. This is what happened. This is what he felt. His visage was so marked. This is what he felt right here. Verse 14, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shared. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Hmm. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell or feel all my bones. They look and stare upon me. The, the part of my garments among them, they cast lots upon my vesture. You remember those stories? This is Jesus on the cross. This is what they did through that process of crucifixion to him physically. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword. My darling from the power of the dog. Now the dog, he's not, he, there might have been dogs there. But dog is another terminology. It's, an, it's another thing. And I won't go into that, but it is another thing altogether. Amen. At verse 22. I will declare thy name unto the brethren in the midst of the congregation. Will I praise thee? Now, what he's talking about, this I will praise thee in the midst of the congregation. He's not talking about when he gets to heaven. He's talking about when he is going into hell and the congregation in hell. He said, I will praise you there in the midst of that congregation that's coming. And when the Bible says he led captivity captive, that's the congregation that he was praising God to right there. And he took 
in Ephesians, he said he took captivity captive and left gifts unto men or gave gifts unto men. That congregation that he took with him to heaven, the Bible says he took them into paradise. They were in the upper regions of Abraham's bosom. The lower regions were where the lost were. The upper region is where the saved or the redeemed were awaiting this event. That great gulf that was fixed from here to there couldn't get one or the other. That's a whole other set of scriptures, a whole other set of teachings. But Jesus took that upper part of the place of departed spirits and he took them with him to heaven. That's what he's talking about. He was telling what's coming. Amen. Are you home? Are you lost here? Are you, you, you okay? Okay. So we find that sin does not only have its limitations to the flesh, but sin has its entrance all the way into the spirit of man. That's why it takes a sinless man to redeem man. Adam gave it away. It took a man to get it back. But it took a sinless man to get it back. One who had no sin in his spirit. Amen? I said amen. Are you tracking with me? And so, we are you with me? All right. Just grunt at me from time to time. Okay, Matthew 12, 39. And he answered and said unto them, an evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now, there are people who do this. Now, they say, well, you know, there, there are these extreme things in Scripture that we don't really believe, that, you know, we just believe they're myths. They just are things that people made up. And one of those things that they say was made up was the flood, of which Jesus referred to himself, as it was in the days of Noah, <laughs> Jesus said. That's the flood. So shall it be. Okay, so Jesus made reference to the flood. If he made reference to the flood, I'm buying it. I'm buying in. Okay, but another one that they, they, that they, they make fun of is Jonah being swallowed by a fish. He just made reference to that one too. So if he made reference to it, I'm, I'm, I'm buying it. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not either foolish enough, dumb enough, or brave enough to say that's not true. If it's in here, it's in here. And that's the end of that story. Okay. He said, but there's a sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That doesn't sound like heaven to me. The Bible says hell is moved from beneath to greet you at thy coming. So the heart of the earth is where hell is right now. And so Jesus didn't go to Calvary and then suddenly ascend to the Father and go directly into heaven. No, he went straight into hell to pay the price for our sins. I said to pay the price for our sins. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, uh, I'm going to speculate here a little bit. But I don't think it's speculation too much because I believe this. Uh, if you don't believe it, you don't have to buy it. But I, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute that I'm going to say this. But I think there was... Now, if I knew that I was going to have to do something for three days and three nights, it would be horrible. Okay? It would be horrible. But at least I would know at the end of three days and three nights, I'd be done. I mean, I can see, I can anticipate, well, it'll be over, you know, two days and 24 seconds, and you, you, you got the countdown going, right? But see, I believe there was something that happened inside Jesus in this whole process to pay the sin debt fully. I believe there had to be somewhere in his awareness that he didn't ever think he'd get out of it. I believe that his sacrifice was that thorough. The same way that a person is stuck in hell today with no hope and no way out, I believe Jesus felt all that. All of it. 
else the sacrifice would have not been complete. He didn't even think he had a way out of it. You say, well, I don't believe he went to hell. Okay, Acts 2, verse 26. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Hmm. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Now, corruption is decay. Now, that was, um, well, it just simply put, the decay or the rotting of the, of the human body. Jesus was not gone long enough from the human body for it to rot. That's what corruption is. Okay. You see in verse 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ and his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. And so again, we have Jesus was not left in hell. Everybody say hell. hell. So he had to go. He had to pay the price. I'm talking to you about the authority of the believer. I'm talking to you about the price that was paid to get it. I was so aware when I was putting this on paper, I was so aware of God speaking to me. He said, my people don't know this. And he said, they need to. And he said, you can pass by quickly if you want to. He said, but I want this spoken. He said, I want this said. He said, I want them to understand what happened. I want them to know this was not a game. And the game that we play with church and all this stuff, this is not a game, guys. What we're involved in here is not a game. This is the real deal. There's nothing ever been more real than this. Now, a lot of it's unseen. It's a mystery. We don't see it all. I mean, there was obviously a body, a corpse that was on the cross that was taken down, that was put in a tomb. That's obvious. But all this other, it was hidden from human eyes. See, we saw the physical part, but we didn't necessarily see the spiritual part. And without the spiritual part, the physical part, to be honest with you, wouldn't matter much. Because it wouldn't redeem you. The physical part wouldn't redeem you. It took the spiritual part to be the redeeming force. Now, we found in Psalms 22 a picture of Jesus on the cross. In Psalms 88, you see a picture of Jesus in hell. Amen? Let's look at it a little bit. O Lord God of my salvation, I've cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come up before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. My soul is full of troubles. This is Jesus' agony in hell. Doesn't sound like paradise to me. When he said to that thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, he dropped that thief on the cross up in the upper regions of the departed spirits in Abraham's bosom while he descended into the lower part of hell. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draweth nigh into the grave. I'm counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberst no more. See, that's what I'm talking about right there. The ones that God remembers no more. Jesus was in a place where he thought God had forgotten him. See, that sin debt was complete. Every part of it, the feelings, the agonies, every part of it was complete and total. Amen. Whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in the darkness of the deeps. You, your wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou afflict me with all the waves, the sin debt. 
Thou hast put away my acquaintances far from, from, from me. Thou hast made me an abomination to them, and I'm shut up and cannot come forth. He, see, that's what I'm talking about. I think he thought he'd never get out. That's too much. That's what he did. Now, do you think that we ought to exercise some authority if that's what it costs to get it? That's what it costs to get it. So in this condition, now, follow me. You tracking with me? We doing okay? You here? All right. Back to the Isaiah 53, verse number 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. So this is God the Father's view of this event. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief or made him sick. He made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed and shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul. That's what we just read in Psalms 88. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Now the word satisfied is a very, very, very important word. The word satisfied means sufficient, filled to the full, completely satisfied, had enough. That's what it means. And so God the Father looking on this sacrifice that Jesus was making, he said, I am completely satisfied that the sin debt is completely paid. There's, there's no more to pay. And so in this condition, the Father said, death and all the things that are attached to it, the high court of heaven is satisfied with the price. The high court of heaven says, it's enough. The high court of heaven says, heaven's court is completely satisfied. Penalty is completely paid. There is no more need for any redeemer, redemption, blood, or anything else. This is paid, period, now and forever. And in that place, in hell, where this is going on, we find over here in Hebrews 1, now we read this last week, but it'll mean a little bit more to you right now. Now these are the conditions into which this was spoken. In hell, Hebrews 1, 4, being made so much better than the angels, he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels saith he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, again, I will be to him a father. Remember, he turned his back on him. And again, And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be unto me a son. So God said, price paid. Mm. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten. Well, I think it's blasphemous to say Jesus was born again. Well, you don't even know scripture. That's the problem you have with that. You think something's wrong just because you don't know the truth. Your ignorance is ruling your life. And you think you're so cocksure you know everything. Just look at it. Read it. Just read it. <laughs> and when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, and he said, this is in hell, let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels, he saith, and he maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. You, you want to get on fire for God? You get a hold of this. He'll make you a flame of fire. I guarantee you that. But unto the Son, he saith, he says certain things to the angels. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy clean kingdom. Jesus was declared righteous in the pit of hell. Sin debt completely paid. 
no more to come. End of story. The devil send his saddle home because he's whipped right now. He has no power over him whatsoever. God the Father called Jesus God in the pit of hell after he had gone through what we just read, that terrible torment on Calvary and the terrible torment of three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And God the Father said it's sufficient. This is enough. I declare you righteous in the pit of hell and there's nobody that can stop it. Now, do you remember we just read a little while ago? You have been made the righteousness of God. That was you too, he spoke about. Because you're in Christ. And that righteousness that he spoke over him is the same righteousness, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that invaded your being at the new birth. And what he declared to Jesus, he declared to you. Now, you don't have a throne to sit on like he does, but you're seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ. You didn't pay the price, but you got the results. You didn't do it, but you get it if you believe it. Now, you find over here in Colossians 2.15... Now, in this condition, it says that (laughs) Colossians 2.15, and having spoiled principalities and powers. That's a demonic power. In the pit of hell, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. So there was evidently something that happened when, when, when hell's gates rattled at the voice of God, and God made the declaration, Thy throne, O God, is forever. In the in the pit of hell, hell rattled. And every demon hit the wall. You can bet on that. Our, our deal's over. Once and for, This is not just pep talk, guys. This is real talk. This is the reality of it. And something happened, and God made an open show of the devil. He drug him by the hair of the head. If he has hair, I don't know. But, but he drug him. Up and down the corridors of heaven, he spoiled him. And he, you remember? In uh, Genesis 3.15, he said, I'll put enmity between thee and thy seed. Talking about the, the devil and on and on. And he said, you'll bruise his heel. That's Calvary. But he'll bruise your head right there. He put his heel on the head and neck of the devil. And say, I got you. Forever I've got you. And I give my servants my name and wherever they find you they're going to cast you out and there ain't one single solitary thing you can do about it the authority of the believer I reckon and so for us to not stand our ground and for us to not stand up and put him under the feet that he's under, do you understand how blasphemous that really is? Do you hear about taking God's name in vain and we think that's using bad words? I'm going to tell you, to not take your position in Christ is to use his name in vain. He gave you his name and he said, now you go into all the world and you cast out the devil wherever you find him. This is the price that was paid to get you that authority. Now you go do it. And we're praying, oh God, would you get the devil off my back? I'll tell you how I want to say it. That ain't the way it works. He wants you to stand up and put some steel in your backbone and put his word in your mouth. And put that sword of the Spirit in your hand. And take the armor, the whole armor of God. And wherever you go, just take him out as you go. He's run roughshod over the church long enough. And if he's running roughshod over your life, today we're going to send his saddle home. Mm -hmm. This is it. Mm Mm-hmm. Because this is the authority of the believer, and God gave it to you. And he said, behold, I'm alive forevermore. And so, uh, well, one more thing. I'm about done, but I don't want to leave this out. 
verse, Revelation 1.18. And he, I am he that liveth and was dead. And he was physically and spiritually. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and death. So he took the keys from him. He has no power over you anymore. Jesus completely dethroned him. You know, he stole that authority from Adam. Well, you, Adam gave it to him, but he trick, through trickery got it. But Jesus got it back. Now you understand why it was a mystery hidden in God. And had the princes of this world known it, they'd have never done this. They'd have never done this. Because it put their trip off eternally. And child of God, he seated you together with him. He's brought you into the family. He's brought you in as an inheritance of the Most High God. He's brought you in at every level and capacity that he has. He didn't just make you righteous. He made you righteous with his righteousness. He, he didn't just give you a little. He gave you everything he's got. Everything the Father has, he gives to you. He made you a joint heir with Christ Jesus, seated together with him in heavenly places. And we walk around and act like we don't have anything. We're so depressed. Oh, my God, it's hurting so bad. Stop the hurt. Stop the pain. You got the words in your mouth. You got the authority of God. Stop it. And we let him run through our families, run through our lives, run through our homes, let him do everything under the sun to us. And we don't even stand up and resist him. He said, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Now, that's my message today on the authority of the believer. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Say, I have, authority. I have authority in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. And, I'm and I'm not giving it up. I'm not giving it away. I'm not, I'm not turning my back on it. I'm, I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. I am the head. I am I'm not the tail. I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed, I'm blessed going out. Blessed. I am seated together. In heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, I can do it. I've got the power. The Holy Spirit lives inside me. He gave me the power. I have it now. I'm not waiting to get it. It lives in me right now. Get behind me, Satan. You have no part in my life. You have no place. I give you no authority over me. I have complete and total authority over you in Jesus name now get out get out get out oh my well I get happy about it don't you praise God Lord we love you let's just bow our heads just a minute and just take a minute just to let some of this sink down inside you because this is the message of the day. Believe me, God wants his church walking. He, he's, he's coming for a glorious church, not a beat down under the table living, barely make it street living. No, he's coming for a glorious church. And you're a part of it. You're a part of it. Say God's glory is on me. His power is on me. His anointing is upon me. I'm more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. Now, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, you know, if you don't know these things because you come into it through the new birth, if you've never been born again, you can't walk in it. Or if you're walking at a distance from God, if you're backslidden, you can't walk in it. But these things are you. If you're at a distance from God, either through you've never been born again or you're walking at a distance through just not serving Him the way you should. I want to pray with you. So I want you to lift your hand up right now and just say, pray for me, Pastor. I want, I want the fullness of what you're talking about right now. Just lift your hand up right now and say, that's me. I want you to pray for me. I see you right over here. I see you, I see you, I see you. Anyone else, you'd say, that's me. I won't call you to the front, I promise. I just want to pray with you right there where you're at. All right, I see you. Anyone else, you'd say, I see you over here. Anyone else, you'd say, that's me. Okay, I see you over here. Anyone else, you'd say, that's me. We don't want to miss anybody today. 
Okay, I see you up here. Anyone else? Hallelujah. Now, if you're watching online, we're including you. you. We maybe can't see your hand, but we can feel your heart. But God can see your hand or the hand in your heart. He knows you. Just identify yourself to Him. Now, Father, I pray for each person that lifted their hand this morning. Many. They want to know you in that, that, that way that we're talking about. That distance is no good anymore. We're crowding right into you, Jesus. And I pray for them today. And now everybody, we're going to help our friends who raise their hand by praying this prayer together. Say, Jesus, Jesus. I take you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. Sin, Satan, I don't serve you. You're not in authority over me anymore. In Jesus' name, you have no place in my life. Jesus, I make you Lord. Now, if you prayed a prayer like that, I know you wouldn't pray without meaning it. Just lift your hands to heaven and just thank God that he hears you. Lord, we thank you that you always hear us. We thank you you never turn us away. And we give you praise for that. We give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Now, I want us to stand a minute. And uh, I want you to just turn to about three people right there. Now, we're not quite dismissed yet, so don't, don't get that active. Okay, be respectful of the room. I want you to turn to about three people, tell them real boldly that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Would you do that?